Let us join together as we call each other to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. The Lord turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into a life-giving spring. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Please be seated. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us join together in the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Forgive us, O God. 
for the frantic ways in which we live and for our unwitting acceptance of the world's values. We seek power we will likely abuse and we accumulate possessions we don't really need. Forgive our misguided attempts to save and secure ourselves. Give us the courage to trust in your daily providence that we might give our energies to seeking first your kingdom. Trusting in your mercy, hear now the confessions we bring in silence to your throne of grace. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is how God describes Himself in the Scriptures. And this is the God we have come to know in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh that dwelt among us. We have come to know God of grace and mercy. And so trust and believe the essential promise of the Gospel. In and through Jesus Christ, we have been made right with God. Our sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God, now and forevermore. Amen. And friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus in whom we find life. Please be seated. We have a couple of joys today. One is to welcome a new family into our official church membership, and the other is to uh, celebrate the sacrament of baptism. If these look like familiar uh, people to you, uh, that's good. I would hate for them to look like strangers to you. Uh, Beth and Chris Thaxton. Beth, uh, if you recognize her, has been our director of youth ministries for a few years now. Um, uh, and, and standing with Chris, who you may not have seen uh, as often if she's seen Beth, um, but they stand together today to uh, officially join our church. We've passed the probationary period, apparently, uh, and, and um, they've decided that, and they're choosing this particularly significant day, the day when their second child is baptized uh, to make this their official church home. When they moved here a few years ago to, uh, for Beth to take up this position, uh, Jack was just a little guy. Now Jack's a big boy, and he has welcomed a little sister into the world now. Uh, and so we've uh, been able to celebrate with this family, this new addition, and, uh, and just the, the, the presence of the Faxton family among us. They are uh, technically transferring here uh, from the South Aiken Presbyterian Church, where uh, Beth was on staff before. Uh, Chris, if you don't know this about him, after a stint in the Navy, has been worked, uh, uh, been in the uh, field of uh, 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 optician, the optician world for the last 
a few years and has been a big help, although he hasn't been able to go on one of the trips yet, has been a big help to our Bolivian mission team in providing some optical uh, expertise and resources. And so uh, has already found an important way to use his gifts uh, in that way. And so uh, they're, they're accompanied in the front of the church today by Sherry Frederick, their uh, elder sponsor. And as I recall, Sherry was the chair of the search committee that brought Beth here. So, and she hasn't stopped smiling since, and uh, for good reason. And so uh, we celebrate with you and are glad to make this official and especially glad to share this special day uh, with you as you present your daughter. Um, for the sacrament of baptism. Why don't y'all come on a little closer to me. We'll gather. Now that we're going to move toward baptism, we're going to gather around the baptismal font. You've done this before with child number one, and I know these promises are important to you. It's uh, formative for you and your family as, uh, as you live together. Um, and I know having the church being a part of this is also important to you, which is this, one of the sacraments of the church. And so I've got a few questions to ask the two of you. Um, and then Cherry's going to have a question for the congregation so that we can uh, share in this uh, wonderful joy of raising a child, and, uh, and then we'll delight in the sacrament of baptism. But first, do you take this opportunity to profess and reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We do. And do you claim Christ's covenant promise not just for yourselves as individuals, but you also claim that promise for your child? We do. Do you promise to love her, to pray for her, to teach her what it means to be a child of God so that she grows up knowing that she belongs to God? We do. We do. And do you look forward to the day when she will stand before a community of believers and profess her own faith in Jesus Christ? We do. We do. Sherry, you have a question for us. We do. Thank you. Okay, sweetie. You can come to me. That's a lot of gown. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, we give thanks for the gift that children are to us. We thank you for your grace bestowed upon them, and that as we baptize with water, we pray that you will baptize with Holy Spirit and that you will surround this little one with your spirit so that she may grow to know you and love you and gladly serve you through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forevermore. Amen. Avery Jane Baxton, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and pray God's richest blessing upon you, now and forevermore. Amen. Will you take a little walk with me? What I want you to think about today is that today gives us a chance to return the favor. Beth, at like youth directors and churches all over the place, devotes a whole lot of her time raising our children. Um, from confirmation class to middle school activities to high school activities to mission trips to Montreat trips to Massanetta trips. She's been gone most of the summer and one of the ways that she can be gone is that she's got a very supportive husband who affirms this ministry, affirms her gifts in ministry, and she's got parents living nearby, which helps too. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a team effort on, an, on the part of the Faxton family. They are committed to your children in ways that are pretty remarkable. What you've just said in saying we do to the question that Sherry asked you, you have just made a commitment to her child and by extension to both children. And so this is a chance for us to do for the Thaxton family what the Thaxton family has done for us, for the young people around here to devote ourselves 
to the raising of their children with the same sort of love and intentionality that they are bringing to the ministry here. Tangibly, what this means is when we make an appeal to keep the nursery or to teach in our church school program or to volunteer for the youth program or to, or to be a part of anything that helps nurture the faith of children. Those are the tangible ways that we give expression to our we do. Otherwise, we've just made an empty promise. But when we say we do, and think about the real children growing up among us, it reminds us that this is a shared enterprise. This is holy work, and we're all in on it. We all benefited from it by being raised, I'm still talking. We all benefited by being raised in the church, and now it falls to us to share the joy of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ with this generation that's coming up after us. It's truly a joy, an honor, and a sacred trust that is now ours. Let us pray. Lord God of grace, help us to be faithful to the promises we've made. Help us to support these parents and all the parents of the church. Help us to love and care for these children that they might know they belong to us, to each other, and ultimately to you. We thank you, O oh God, for the way we were nurtured in the faith. Help us to give that same gift to this next generation that they might love you with their whole hearts, mind, soul, and strength, to the glory of your name, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now let us sing together. As we continue to think about the joys and concerns of the congregation, I wanted you to know some of the things that have been on our minds uh, around here as a, as a staff and congregation. As you know, I'm sure by now that we had two funerals here this week, which gave us a chance as a church family to celebrate lives well lived and to come in support of, of family members. Uh, the service for Jim Rayner was on Monday and then the service for Blue Hatch a longtime member of the church was on Thursday of this week. We just learned this week uh, um, through a Presbyterian newsletter of all things, these uh, grandparents didn't announce it from the rooftops for us, but Bill and Melanie Taylor have become grandparents uh, because their son John and his bride uh, welcomed into the world uh, Katie. And so uh, we celebrate uh, with the whole uh, Taylor family. We also have learned about a couple of deaths uh, to our extended church family. Uh, Russ Johnson's father, Edward Russell Johnson, died uh, July the 26th, and we just learned about it this week, and just uh, learned this morning that early, in the early hours of this morning, Louise Gilfillan's mother died. And uh, uh, it looks like the services will be held on Tuesday in Roper, North Carolina. So please keep the Gilfillan family in your prayers as this is all very, very new and fresh to them. As God's people then, let's join together in a time of prayer. Lord God of grace, we are grateful that you have drawn near to us and are grateful that you invite us to draw near to you. Though we often feel alone and at risk when we remember your goodness and your faithfulness to us, we are given strength for this journey, and we are given hope which bears us up. 
This morning we turn to you with our hopes and our hungers, trusting that you are Lord of all and that you seek our well-being. Lord God of grace, for our many reasons of thanksgiving, for those we love and those who love us, for those who taught us the faith and those who continue to do so, for this church and for our mission in the world, we give you thanks. And we pray that you will pour out your blessing upon us as we seek to be faithful to who you've called us to be. Broadening our concern, O God, we pray your blessing upon our nation and for our leaders and pray that they will be guided by your will and your will alone. Broadening our scope even further, O God, we pray for the nations of the world, especially for the people of the world, for those who dwell in lands of violence or political unrest or uncertainty. We pray for the people of the world who, un, who know fears and anxieties that we do not, and we pray that you will be attentive to them. Give us an openness, O God, to the hungry and the poor and the outcast, the very ones to whom Jesus was drawn. And we thank you, O God, that by your grace we are able to reach out into the world. We thank you for the work of our outreach center, for the work of our missionaries, and for the work of those who set out from us from time to time on short-term missions. We thank you, O God, for the good you are doing through us. But we also look ahead, O God, for the coming kingdom, for a time when the wolf will dwell with the lamb, when the lion will lie down with the kid. We look for a time when the whole world is drawn to one another because we are all drawn to you. And we pray, O God, for clarity in how you would use each one of us in the fulfilling of your purpose on this earth. We daily seek clarity in how our own individual lives can best honor you. But we are also glad we are more than individuals, that we are a family of faith knit together. And so now with voices united, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If I could have all the children come down, please. Let's sit right here, okay? Sit right here. Sit right here. Let's back up just a little bit. Back. I have some stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh yes. The washboard is very good. Thank you. We'll put this right next to you. Okay.
Okay, well, thank you for letting me come to see you today. I'm here because of you, and I brought some toys for us to play with. Is that okay? Yeah. So how about instruments? Technically, yes, they're instruments, yes. And I think they're toys, too, but they're yeah, instruments, yes. So how about we pick one that you see in front of you, and we'll go through it, okay? Of course, pick whatever you would like to pick. Go ahead. Perfect, good deal, all right. So we are gonna form the first ever Children's Moment Orchestra, okay? But we need a name, okay? So we need a name for our orchestra. So I need this side to come and give me a color, some color, and how about you all give me a name of an animal? This side over here, a color, any color you guys like. Pink? Pink zebras, we are the pink zebras. Very good, okay, this is great. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the pink zebras in front of us. Okay, now let's just play a flower instrument. And the first rule is, okay, if, I, if you see me go like this, that means we stop. We all got to come together at once, okay? We got to feel like we know what we're doing, right? This is our first performance, and we really haven't rehearsed much, but that's okay. All right, here we go. So let me hear it. Ready? Go. job. Okay, so let's look at what we have to play with. Does anyone know what this is? Drum. drum. This is a very good. It's a drum. It's a djembe drum it's from West Africa. Um, and then what we have here, what is this? This is called a slit drum or a wood drum. Actually, it has a number of different sounds. You play with the stick. You play the djembe with your hand. And what do we have over here? A washboard. A washboard. Yes, you're not cleaning your clothes today. Um, this is a washboard and is actually a very important instrument to North Carolina. It was part of the blues tradition in North Carolina, and it's what helped North Carolina and the rock and roll get its start. It was a lot because of the, the washboard. What do we have here? What do we have here? Those are sticks. Now, these sticks have special names. They're called claves, okay? Claves are, in most Latin American African music, this is the most important instrument out there, okay? Because you actually create, you make them sound really, really loud, okay? Now, my good friend of mine made those for us. Yes? Good for you. Rhythm six, they are called rhythm six as well. Okay, clavis, rhythm six. You know what? This is another type of drum right here. This comes from West Africa, right? This is called, this is my favorite, one of my favorites called a kinkini, right? You play it on this side, and then you, ha you have a bell here on top. It's called a banana bell. You play it at the same time. It's like the drum set, if you will. What do we have back over here? These are called bongos. Good job, bongos. Yeah, you play those with your fingertips. Very good. We have some clavis right here. It is very, very heavy, I know. And we have here, do you know what these are? Those are just shakers, yeah, they're shakers. Uh, you can also have these, they're called shakers too, okay? A lot of different sounds. They all make different, different sounds, right? See how different that is? And then you have this one, and you have that one. Play that one. Yeah, and that one. See, there's orchestra out there, nothing but shakers. It's actually really, really cool, all right? Now here, what about this one? Has anyone seen this one before? It is a thing in your instrument, yeah. You're exactly right. Awesome. This is called a thumb piano. It has a lot of many different names, but it's called thumb piano. You play it like a piano, but you play it with your thumbs and your fingers. It's one of my favorite instruments out there. This one's actually pretty out of tune. It's actually quite old, too. It's like 50 years old. So that's one of my favorites. All right, cool. All right, what are we are again? The pink zebras. Very good. Pink zebras. All right, now switch instruments real quick. We're going to have to do another performance, okay? Who wants a Jimmy? You got the Jimmy? Um, I, don't, I don't have anybody to switch with. Here, you have what you want. One of these? These are actually very important. All right, here we ready? I think you want to switch this one? You want to try this? Here we go. Thanks, Solomon. This is very easy. It is heavy, right? Thank you. All right, for our next performance, we have some new rules, okay? When you see me go like this or like this, that means get louder. And when you see me go like this, that means get softer, okay? This is something called dynamics, okay? Forte piano, something called dynamics. So we, music is a lot about making expressions and, 
connecting with God, what I feel music is part of, deepening our connection with God, and how we can do that is with dynamics, okay? So I'm going to say five, six, seven, eight, all right? This is for our next performance. When, I, when you see, watch my hands, okay, and see how we can change dynamics, the sound, how loud we go with our instruments, okay? Are we ready? Five, six, seven, eight. That was awesome, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, did you learn something today? That was an awesome performance. What well, pink, so pink zebras? Okay, thank you very much. All right, we all want to return to your seats and feel come back anytime to play my instruments. That'd be great. Oh, actually, I have gifts for you guys here. I have some claves. Take the claves. Okay. You get to keep them? Yes, you get to keep them. And your parents are really appreciate it. I think. Let us pray for illumination. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and lead us into your truth for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our lesson today is from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, the song of the unfruitful vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Ah, you who join house to house, who add field to field until there is room for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, Surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield a mere ephah. This is the word of the Lord.
Every now and then some of you tell me that you like sermons that make you squirm. <clears throat> You're going to love this. Um, uh, for the rest of you, uh, just hang in there with me. We're uh, looking for our, at our second text from the 12th chapter of Luke's record of the gospel, beginning our reading at the 13th verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Help us be attentive to your word, O God, even then when they are difficult words to hear. Help us draw near your living word, Jesus Christ even when he invites us to follow a challenging path. Be at work among us now with the gift of your spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The story I heard years ago, could have told it with you by now, but it's a story of a conversation between a, a young man just getting started in his business and an elderly gentleman who had long since retired from his. One, the young man, had his whole future ahead of him and the other could only look back and remember. One was very smart, having been to the best undergraduate and graduate programs around. The other one was very wise, having lived a long time and seen and learned many things. And for obvious reasons, the older gentleman took an interest in this energetic and enthusiastic young man, for in him he saw himself. He saw himself as he had been some 60 years before. He remembered in looking at this young man about his own energy and his own intense determination. He looked at this young man who was just getting started and he remembered his own drive for success. He looked at the young man and knew there were many things he could teach him. But he also knew, remembering from experience, that the last thing this young man would want would be advice from an old man. And so he decided to simply ask a question. What are your plans? Well, the young man was so filled with plans that he went on and on, told him about the plans to devote himself day and night, night and day, to getting this new business off the ground. And then what, he said. Well, then I plan to expand, to hire more employees, maybe open up additional offices. And then what? Well, and then I plan to build my fortune. And then what? 
And then I plan to acquire all the things that will help me enjoy my life. And then what? Well, and then I will retire as a wealthy man at an early age, and I will live on the fruits of my labors. And then what? Well, by now, the young man had grown tired of being questioned by this bothersome senior citizen, and so he decided to end this interrogation by saying, well, I suppose that one day I will grow old like you, and then I will die. And then what? He asked. And then what? The young man had been prepared to answer all the other questions, but he was not prepared to answer that one. And truth be told, it had taken a lifetime for the older gentleman to realize that that was the one question that needed to be asked. Because now he stood very close to the edge of eternity, was coming very close to his own mortality. And he knew this was the question that really mattered. For it was a question that reminds us that the time is coming when we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, a God who places very little value on the things that we value so much, a God who measures our lives differently than we do, a God who cares far more about what we do with what we have than with what we have. It's right there in the parable that we read this morning from Luke's Gospel. Jesus here seems to be saying that God is profoundly interested in what we do with our abundance. You see, the man in the parable has a problem. There had been a lot of rain in Palestine that year, and his land had produced a bumper crop. And the barns that had been completely adequate the year before that were completely full this year, even before the harvest was in. It's a nice problem to have as a farmer, but it was still a problem. The grain had to be stored somewhere. And so after thinking about it for a while, he decided that what he needed to do was tear down his barns and build bigger barns. Perfect sense. Too many crops, too little barn. Need a bigger barn except that God showed up that very night and calls him a fool. And with nothing to show for his life but a barn full of crops and architectural renderings for an even bigger barn, his life comes to an end. And all the things that he thought mattered so much, now they'll probably just rot there in the barn. All the things he thought mattered so much turn out not to matter very much at all. Now at the heart of this rich man's problem is that he listened to bad advice. And he listened to bad advice because the one he turned to for advice was himself. The way Jesus tells the story, it's almost comical. This is sort of how it goes. Self, what do you think I should do with all this grain? Well, self, I've been thinking. I think you ought to pull down your barns and build bigger barns. Self, that's brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? Self, well, actually you did. That's how this conversation went. Faced with the dilemma of a bounty of riches, he didn't go talk to his rabbi. He didn't talk to any of the sages in the community. He didn't go ask his neighbors what he might do with this dilemma. He didn't sit down with the scriptures to see if his faith tradition could shed any light on this. Instead, he talked to himself. He convened a meeting with me, myself, and I and came up with a plan that seemed to make sense to him. And it made sense to him because it further enriched him, gave him more wealth, more security, more stuff. 
And so having had this conversation with a committee of one, he had a plan in place, a plan that seemed to make sense to him, but which God called foolish. What a verdict to have placed upon your whole life at the end of your life that you've been a fool, that you've missed the point of the whole thing. This is always the danger when the only voice we hear is our own. Or perhaps we only listen to voices that affirm what we already think. It turns out that we by ourselves are not the best source of wisdom for ourselves because our tendency will always be to do what's in our interest, which means if our voice is the only voice we consult, we'll likely ignore the voice of God and we'll also ignore the cries of our neighbors. Thus, we tend to make decisions in an insulated bubble of self-concern. And what happens is we end up building bigger barns for ourselves despite the fact that we live in a world of hunger and emptiness. And when we do that, God's verdict on such a life is that it's foolish. You may have never thought about it in this way, but one reason you belong to a church and one reason the church employs pastors and Christian educators is so that you will have alternative voices available to you. So that instead of making ethical decisions or financial decisions, life decisions, instead of making the big decisions of life within the confines of your own head, and your own self-interest. You come to church to be reminded that there are other voices to be considered. To be reminded that God might have a thing or two to say about what we do with our abundance, with our riches. And that more than likely, God will not be urging you to build bigger barns for yourselves, not in a world like this one. Not in a world where children go hungry and where clean water is a luxury that some cannot afford. And where people who have our sorts of blessings have the capacity to do so much more than build bigger barns. One reason you come to church and have people like me around to nag you is so that you'll be reminded that there is another voice that wants to be in on the conversation. That there's another voice that wants to get your attention to help guide us away from the sort of self-centered folly to which we are all susceptible, and to lead us instead toward lives of compassionate neighborliness, of life-giving generosity, a life which has a deep awareness of what really matters and which in all things seeks to glorify God. Real-life example of how this can work. Back in 1986, there was a terrible drought in South Carolina, and farmers in South Carolina were desperate because they didn't have enough feed to feed their livestock. When news of this began to spread, hay from all over the country found its way to South Carolina, tons and tons of hay given by farmers in other parts of the country, given to people they did not know to feed cattle they would never see in hopes of saving farms they would never visit. Back where they lived, they must have had a surplus, which means they could have built bigger barns, but they didn't. They didn't have to lift a finger to help South Carolina farmers, but they did. They realized they had enough to meet their own needs. They saw needs elsewhere, and they responded. And so for a few weeks during the summer of 1986, 
The world works the way it's designed to work, bringing joy, I think, to the one who designed it. And then, a few years later, providentially, South Carolina farmers were in a position to respond to similar needs elsewhere. And again, I can only assume that God was pleased. I'm about to tell you a story that I wish no one had told me because it complicated my life. I've probably told it to you before, but if I haven't, I'm going to, so your life can be complicated too. It's a story about John Wesley. I'm not above telling stories about the Wesley brothers. They were Methodists, but that's all right. They were part of the evangelical revival that took place in England in the 18th century. When John Wesley was teaching at Oxford University, he had an annual income of 30 pounds a year. I don't know if that's a lot or a little when he, was, when he, when he had it, but 30 pounds a year, he lived on 28 and gave two to charity. When his income reached 60, he lived on 28 and gave the rest to charity. When his income reached 90, he lived on 28 and gave the rest to charity. When his income reached 120 pounds a year, he lived on 28 and gave the rest to charity. You see the pattern here. He apparently did not see a need for a bigger barn, but he did see needs, real needs, out on the streets of England. Now hand on the Bible, it would be hypocritical of me to suggest that you follow the extreme example of John Wesley because I haven't. But I don't think it is so extreme that we can ignore what his life teaches us. There comes a point where we have the things we need. We're comfortable. Our children, those who depend upon us, are taken care of. We have ensured ourselves against the proverbial rainy day. We don't really need a bigger barn, not when so many of our neighbors have no barn at all. Now, unlike some places, Jesus doesn't suggest in this parable that we give away all that we have and live in poverty. Instead, he simply challenges us to ponder the question. When you have enough, why, why do you need more than enough? I keep waiting for Jesus to ask me simple questions. But that's what I hear him asking me here. When we have enough, might we use our considerable riches for the glory of God? It's a simple question, but what it does at its heart is that it at least invites another voice, God's voice, into our conversation. And the other thing I think about when I read this, and it's what I'll leave you with, when I read those words, and they're sort of haunting words, tonight your life is demanded from you. When I hear those words one day, as I will, I hope I'm not busy drawing up plans for a bigger barn. Instead, I hope I'm looking for ways to reflect and reveal God's grace, looking beyond my own wants and taking into consideration the needs of the world. That instead of trying to figure out how much I can carry and keep, I hope I'm trying to figure out how I can reach out to my neighbors in an act of generosity to them and as an act of praise to God. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
standing in the presence of God, let us say what we believe using the words that have been passed through the church from generation to generation. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. I mentioned to the folks at the early service that my worship professor in seminary said that if worship is ever running long and you have to skip something, don't skip the offering. His point was not that the church is in such desperate need of what you offer. His point was that the offering is the point in the service that your congregation is given an opportunity to gladly and with generosity offer themselves in thankful praise. And so let this moment be a time of worship for you as you offer yourselves in gratitude for the grace of Jesus Christ.
Let us pray. Lord God of grace, you have richly blessed us. Now use us as a blessing to the world. Make us fit to be your disciples. Visit us with your strong spirit. And then send us along the path which will honor you. To the glory of your name and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the point is this, with the decisions you make in your life, those large and small, those that you know are important and those that you're not even sure are important, allow God's voice to enter into the conversation that you might be called to a new place of faithfulness that will bring new joy to your heart and glory to God. And now grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you with those you love and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.